I was thinking one of the very important ways for us to stay where the Lord is, where the blessing is, is he teaches us to, to bring every thought captive to him. Every thought. Because when we leave that special abiding place and, and we begin to fall into the deceits, Oh, of the enemy, that's how he gains a foothold. And pretty soon, it's difficult. Isn't that a good thing to remember? So simple. God's ways are so simple, but profound and also powerful. Well, let's bow our heads and, and pray together. Oh, Father, more than anything, more than anything tonight... We want you to be here, O oh Father. Lord, that you would speak life into our hearts through the power of your word, O oh God. You have so much, so much, O oh Father, for us as your people to do, O oh God. Oh, so much on your heart, a great and a needy world, O oh Father. Your mighty plans and your mighty purposes, and O oh Father, Father. Come and let them come alive to us by the power of your spirit. Oh, yes, Lord. Be here. Be here. Open our hearts, oh, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When God brought his people out of Egypt, he was bringing them to a land that he had already promised many, many years before to Abraham. In fact, in Genesis, the 15th chapter and verse 18, this is what God said to Abraham. To your children, I believe it's on this next one, he said, to your seed, I have given this land. <laughs> and this was before Abraham had any children at all. But by promise, God had already given this land to his people. This was God's heart. When he brought them out of Egypt, when he brought them out of Egypt, it was that they would possess this land that he had spoken of so, so, so many years before. What was this land like? What was it like? Well, the Bible tells us this. It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. That seems strange to us. It was an important thing because God said it 20 times in his word. He repeats that statement. You and I know that milk, when, it, when a baby is born and it lives on milk for some time, it is a source of strength, right? It has the power to, as their little bones grow. So milk is, is, is flowing strength, that which gives strength. And, and this is what else we know. Whether you're a farm boy or girl or not, milk does not flow. It comes with lots of hard work. It's hard work. You will never find a river of milk. No. You get it by the bucket and you work at it, right? And so it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a supernatural thing. But also honey was actually the sweetest Thing known on earth, right? In the natural, in the natural, not, not synthetic or, or artificial. And it was so, it was the sweetest. And he said, this land will be a land of supernatural strength and it's full of sweetness. It flows with honey. Secondly, he said, this land that I want to bring you to, it's a land that drinks the water of the rain of heaven. In Egypt, the people had to irrigate by hand. 
carrying water either from the Nile or, or whatever, and by hand to water every plant. God said, not this kingdom I'm bringing you to, that I've promised you. It drinks of the water of the rain of heaven. Jesus talked about this living water in quite a few places, John 4, John 7. Oh, he says, whoever drinks of the water I give, it will be in him a fountain of water. In John 7, he said, when you receive my spirit, out of you will flow rivers of living water. God's kingdom is an extraordinary place. He said also, this land I'm bringing you to, it's a land that God's eyes are on continually. In that verse, he says, God cares, takes care of this land. And lastly, in Ezekiel 20 and verse 6 and 15, he said, this land is the glory of all the lands on this earth. There is no place like the kingdom of God. Now on the way to Canaan, though, God's people had to pass through the wilderness to get from Egypt to Canaan. This was not lost time. It was very important time. For there, in the wilderness, God taught his people his statutes. His statutes. And statutes are how we know God, how we can have a relationship with God, his statutes. But also, God taught them his judgments. And judgments are how we treat one another. And he spoke of them in Leviticus, but also in Exodus 21. He says, now these are my judgments. And then he proceeded to teach them about what an employer should do. And what you should do if someone murders someone. And what you do with thieves or with those who kidnap people. What, how you lend money. Many, 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 many things. He says, this is the right way, my judgments. That's what he taught them in the wilderness so that they would be a holy people in his sight. But also there in that wilderness time, he guided them to make him a tabernacle. He said, make me a tabernacle. And it wasn't something thrown together, a piece here and a piece there, and I think this is a good idea and all that kind of thing. Oh no. God was very specific. He gave Moses very specific instructions for that tabernacle. He said, because I want you to build it so that I can dwell among you. And so that was something else that happened in the wilderness. Yes, the wilderness was a place where they grew to know the Lord. It was in this wilderness time, though, too, that God provided for them. Every day from heaven, he sent manna for them to eat. He brought water out of the rock. Yes, he was their provision. Also, there in the wilderness, he gave them his presence. For the Bible says that his cloud was over them, the cloud of his presence. And when it moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stayed. And it was the cloud of his presence by day, and it was the pillar of fire by night. And also there in the wilderness, he also was their protection. So there in the wilderness, you know, they had his provision, his protection, and his presence. But this is what we want, we must know. That's all very, very good. But it was not God's heart that they stay there. That they lived their whole lives in the wilderness. Saying, you know, as long as I have God's provision, God's protection, and a little of God's presence, that's it. Let's just live here in the wilderness. And you know what? 
some of them did. They lived and died in the wilderness and never came to the place that God longed to bring them to when he brought them out of Egypt. It was never his intention that they live their whole life in the wilderness. He had a glorious kingdom for them to possess. It was the glory of all the lands, and that was his heart for them. Did you know when God brought you and I out of our slavery to sin, our Egypt, when we were slaves to sin, it was never his intention that you and I live in the wilderness our entire Christian lives. Just very happy for a little of God's presence, a little of his, well, his perfect provision. Remember the Bible says their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes and their clothes didn't even wear out. And divine protection. God never intended that to be the entirety of our Christian life, and that's where we live it, always. It is not his heart. No. For you see, if that's where we live our whole Christian lives, his presence, his provision, his protection, we will never see God's enemies defeated. God told them in Deuteronomy 7.1, you are going to possess Seven nations, nations greater and mightier than you are. He said to them in Deuteronomy 9, 7, you are going to possess nations whose cities, whose cities are fortified to heaven. Fortified to heaven. God says you're going to possess them. I want my kingdom to come. If you and I live in the wilderness our entire Christian lives, we will never see God's promises fulfilled. They lie as dormant things. I'm going to need my Bible. They lie as dormant things. Things that God has spoken in. Things that, that were on his heart, but unless we leave the wilderness and enter the land of, of his promises, we will never see them fulfilled. Nope, God has a glorious kingdom for us, a very powerful and glorious kingdom. When God brings us out, of our slavery to sin. Yes, there is a time in the wilderness and it is important. We learn his statutes, his judgments. We learn his presence and, and many of those things. It is important. But Jesus said about his kingdom, he said in John 12, 32, it is the father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. You and I remember that the kingdom of, of Israel was God's kingdom on this earth. But Jesus said now in John, Luke 17, 21, now the kingdom of God is within you. To enter God's kingdom, you're born of his spirit. The enemies of God's kingdom, you won't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Jesus said to be greatest in his kingdom, to, to accomplish much, to have the power and the strength, he said, you must be converted in Matthew 18, one through four. You must be converted and become as a little child. I have to leave my independence. 
and Jesus must be Lord. And he said, and then, whoever humbles himself as a little child, the same is greatest in this kingdom. Like a little child who is fully dependent and fully yielded. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, There are some of you standing here who won't die until you see the kingdom come in power. And sure enough, it wasn't very long after that, after Jesus' death and resurrection, because it was then, that was, that was when the kingdom of God came. Because Jesus' death and resurrection took care of the penalty and the power of sin, and now his people could be filled with God's Holy Spirit and be, forgive me, little Jesuses. The Bible says that. We are the body of Christ on this earth. Be little Jesuses everywhere, powerful entities. And sure enough, just as Jesus said, it was only a short time later that after Jesus had ascended to the Father, that Peter preached that, that morning and 3,000 people came to salvation and were baptized. Yes, it says after that, that daily, daily, daily souls were added to the church. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, verse 16, he says that multitudes from all of the cities around Jerusalem brought their sick to Jerusalem and those possessed with devils. And it says they were healed, everyone. God's kingdom had come in power. Satan, who had usurped this earth and still does for so long, God finally found those who would restore God's authority and Satan would be displaced. This is such the heart of God that when the disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus said, well, your first request is this. Oh, Father, your kingdom come. That's to be the burning thing in our lives. Oh, God, take me out of the wilderness. If my whole Christian life is only your presence, your protection, and your provision. Oh, Father, your kingdom come. This earth is yours, but Satan is displaced only where Jesus' lordship is brought into play through us as his believers. Here's our question then. How do we leave the wilderness and take God's kingdom? How do we do it? Sometimes we say, you know, we've never been there before. We, we, we can't say, well, my uncle somebody and my grandpa this or my neighbor this. No. Just like God's people, that, that first generation that came out didn't take the land that God had promised with its giants and walled cities. They didn't. And so the Bible says when they had all died and their children rose up, that they decided that they were going to go in and possess the promises of God. And tonight we're going to look at Joshua, the first chapter, and see the seven things that God said Joshua must do to take the kingdom, seven things 
that he must know or do. Here's the first one, Joshua 1 and the first verse. Actually, I was going to turn here. Let me, that would be a great help to me. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2, he says to Joshua, the Lord says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land that I give them. I'm getting ahead of myself, but the very first... Oh, okay, yes. It's all right. I thought I got ahead of myself. The very first thing is this. We must understand that Moses is dead. You remember in, in, in Hebrews 3, God compares um, Moses to the Lord Jesus because he says Moses was faithful in all his house just as Jesus was. Moses said, there's going to come a prophet um, after me just like me and him you must hear. And Jesus quoted that verse in the Gospels, in his earthly ministry. But you know what? This is what we know. Jesus is not on this earth in his earthly body anymore. And he's never going to be. Oh, he's going to return someday in his, in his, uh, in his resurrection body. But our Moses is dead. We can't pray prayers like, oh, Jesus... Jesus, just take the kingdom, Jesus. Jesus, do something about this unsaved world. Jesus says, nope. Moses is dead. And Joshua, it's time for you to get up, arise, and go. <gasps> Did you know you and I can never just be sleeping or spiritually sleeping? Spiritual sleep is when we're born of God's spirit, but we are unattentive to the voice of the spirit. Just like when we sleep, we're alive, but nobody can communicate with us. Jesus talked a lot about sleeping. He says, don't sleep. And in, in the epistles, he said, oh, don't be like those that sleep, right? But you and I will never be spiritually sleeping, unattentive to the voice of God's spirit, and wake up one day and say, why, look at that. I just killed five giants in my sleep. Wow, I took the stronghold of the enemy. Wow, we made inroads into, into Satan's territory today. I didn't even know it. It was all by mistake. It will never happen. He said to Joshua, you have to get up. Moses is dead. You have to get up and go. Jesus said, yes, the church in Ephesians 5.30, he said this, the church is my flesh and my bones. Yes, we are the body of Christ here. But secondly, he said, every place that you walk, that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given to you. Oh, make that your meditation verse this week. Every place the sole of your foot walks, I will give to you? No, I have given to you. God said this land already belongs to you. I already told you that. Jesus, when he came, he won every battle against the enemy. That's not something we have to fight. And so he says, wherever you will walk by faith into Satan's territory, it will belong to you. It is yours. Thirdly, he said to him this, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, down to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun. This will be your coast. So thirdly, he said, 
Here are the exact parameters of my kingdom that I have given you. You and I never have to guess, ooh, am I taking something that isn't mine? Ooh, am I stepping out to some place God hasn't given? Uh, no. Do you know what? Jesus gave all the boundaries of his kingdom. He said in Luke 10, I have given you all power over all the power of the enemy. So were you and I step there by faith? We're not saying, well, I, I don't know. Maybe that's not the boundaries of the kingdom. Maybe that's not what belongs. Oh, yes, it does. He's told us our boundaries. In John 14, verse 12, Jesus said, He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. We don't say, oh, I think maybe I'm stepping out. Maybe it's not where God is. Maybe this isn't, doesn't belong to me. He has given us the boundaries, promise after promise, from the mouth of our Moses, from the heart of our God, the land he has given us. Fourthly, God said this in Joshua 1, 5, as I was with Moses... So I will be with you. Oh, do you remember when Jesus came and he took the kingdom, right? He usurped. Not he, was, he took the places that Satan had usurped God's power, right? Every place where Jesus went, God reigned there. Whether he raised the dead, whether he healed the lepers, the sick, the demon possessed. Every place that Satan had taken authority in this earth, when Jesus came, he displaced him and God's kingdom came there. But now he says, as I was with your Moses, with your Jesus, I will be with you. I'm going to be with you. Do you remember Jesus said, oh, Father, you're always with me. Jesus said, I and the Father, we are one. But that's what Jesus has said about you and me. He says in John 15, abide in me and I in you were one. I'm the head in this covenant we have and you're the body. We're one. Yes. In John 17, Jesus said these beautiful, beautiful words. He said, the glory that you gave me, he's speaking to the Father, I have given them. He said, I am in them, and Father, you are in me. Yes, as he was with Moses, so he will be with us. But number five, he says this. Only be strong and very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. About what? Well, he says that you may observe to do all of the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Just a little, we're just a little off. He says, don't do it. That you may prosper wherever you go. We must be obedient to the word of God. Jesus said it like this. He said, if a man loves me, he will obey my word and my father will love him and we will come and make our home with him. We will have the presence of God within us if we obey his word. Sometimes you and I think 
that a little deviation to the right is not such a big deal. You know, the way of, of, of the narrow way that leads to life, it's close. I'm close. And then we begin to quote to ourselves cliches that are really frightening if we adopt them as truth. Well, God knows nobody's perfect. It's true, nobody's perfect, but everyone can repent and come back to the place of God's standard and truth. It's only when we lower that standard and say this is acceptable that we will not take the kingdom. As many times as we have to repent according to the light of his word, that's all right with God. That's all right. But if we say, you know, I'm tired of repenting, I'm tired of failing, I know the Bible says this, but, but, so I'm just going to lower the standard and live right here and just hope God doesn't mind. Well, I know God minds, but I know another thing else. You and I will be defeated. Like when God's people tried to take little Ai when Achan's sin wasn't moved from the camp. It's the same thing. Next, he says, number six, he tells us this. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. It's got to be your confession. Whatever comes out of my mouth has to line up with God's word. But this is what he said. You shall meditate in it day and night so that you can be careful to obey all that is written therein. Meditating on the word of God causes it to dwell in my heart. Because you remember, I think we've shared this somewhere along our, our different teachings, that when you and I read the word of God, it enters my head. So there I have knowledge of it. It's sort of like taking food and putting it on my plate. So there it is mine. But it's only as I take that word of God and I process it, I receive it. I say, this is how I will walk in it. This is what I must change. This is what must be moved. This is where I must yield afresh and anew. This is where I must line up. This is what I'm, where I must change. It's only by meditation that the word of God moves from my head to my heart. And remember, he said, the word shall not depart out of your mouth. But the Bible teaches us that what's in my heart comes out of my mouth. Mm, very much it goes together. And here he said, to be powerful takers of God's kingdom, this living word of God has to be my spiritual food. And I tell you, the more I, I, I'm a soldier, the more I'm going after it, the more energy I'm going to consume. And the more I've got to take this word, this living word of God that gives me spiritual power and strength and faith. Yes. Lastly, in number seven, he says... Haven't I commanded you? <laughs> you know what you and I say? Well, look at that. A new option in my life. Hmm, isn't that a nice idea? I've got to start to think about that. That is not so. For God's people who came out of Egypt, Canaan was not an option. It was God's command. They were to go in and take, <clears throat> excuse me, the giants and the walled cities and walk with God and do what he said and watch them fall for the glory of God's kingdom. 
It wasn't an option. Now, some of you would like to go and some of you would like to stay, or maybe all of you would prefer. And for God's kingdom to be what God's longed for it to be. You and I taking the kingdom is not an option. God said here, have I not commanded you? And then he says this, be strong. Do you remember in Ephesians 6, verse 10, he says, be weak in the Lord. No, he says, be strong in the Lord. In the Lord, be strong. You mean we, there, there's something? Yes, we can be weak in the Lord. We can be. We can have sin that, that we play with and it makes us diseased, spiritually diseased. We haven't cleansed and rid and gotten those antibiotics of the blood of Jesus just to get that out of our system so we're strong, full of energy again. We can be feeding on spiritual saltines one or two a day. And so we're so weak spiritually. We spend hours on our phone, maybe, or hours on media, whatever, television, computer, whatever. And yet our devotional is six and a half minutes max. And, and we're so weak spiritually. Many reasons we could be weak spiritually. We spoke before maybe of, of that we haven't cast down our reasonings. And every high thing in our life that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and brought every thought into captivity to, to the obedience of Christ. He's my Lord, so we're going to walk and think as one. Many things can weaken us. But here he says, if we're going to be kingdom takers, he says, you be strong and very courageous. God doesn't want us ever to shrink back. Well, you know, today's just not the day. I'm not in the mood. I, I don't think I'm up to it. I, God says, no, no. I want you to wake up every day and say, oh, God, I'm moving with you. I'm believing you, God. I'm walking with you. Don't leave me behind, oh, God. Don't leave me on that side of Jordan. God, I know you're moving. I know your heart has so many desires and longings for us. I'm going with you. I will be courageous today. And then he says this, don't be afraid. Oh, God says, don't be afraid. He said, just fear me. <laughs> just fear me. He says, don't be afraid of anything else. And he says, neither be dismayed. Dismayed is anxiety that comes from the unexpected. God said, I have it all. And he says, this is why you're to be strong and courageous and not be afraid and not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God. We know what a God is, isn't it? It's the only one who can meet every need of our spirits and souls and bodies with regards to the past and the present and the future. He's God. There's no other gods. There's idols, but no other God. And he said, I want you to be strong, courageous, not be afraid and never be dismayed because the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. I know God is challenging our church and those who ha are listening to be kingdom takers, to go where God's told us to go, to leave the wilderness where, well, it's very nice to have God's presence and provision and protection, but that will never save this world that belongs to him. Let's pray together.